Okay, well, um, actually, I think you're supposed to get started. <laughs> oh, I am. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I am. So, so welcome. Uh, and uh, just to, to let you know that we are sponsored in this interview by the Academy of Professional Dialogue, um, and uh, of which Linda and I are both uh, board members of the U.S. Academy, because the Academy has... Um, so separate academies in many different countries, and the U.S. is one of them. And Germany and many other countries have have a sort of a branch as were of the academy. Uh, so um, I, I think I think in the chat that Bobby, uh, who is our host with technology, will put in the chat the website for the academy. And I also want to mention that the uh, Academy of Professional Dialogue is having a virtual um, conference that will be in October, October 26th through the 30th, four days. Uh, so uh, check out on the uh, website uh, about that and, and join in if you can. Um, and I guess the other thing we want to do before we, before I do turn it over to Linda officially, is that we would ask Bobby if she will take a picture of all of us. So if you can turn your camera on, those who don't have it on now, that would be lovely. And um, and we have two screens, so she'll have to do it twice. So Bobby. Okay, so everyone, so we can smile. give me a big smile uh, in three, two, one. Thank you. <laughs> And are you going to do the other screen as well, or did you I do am, one? No, I'm going to do the other screen. Okay. Okay, and then again, if we can get another big smile in three, two, one. Thank you. All right. So we are officially started. I will turn it over to Linda. All right, well, we are extremely honored today to uh, be interviewing Bill Isaacs. He is one of the true pioneers in the development of dialogue in our world today. He uh, is a founder and CEO of his firm called Dialogos, which is a strategic dialogue and leadership development consulting firm uh, based in Concord, Mass. Uh, he's also part of uh, the Organizational Learning Center, which he helped to co-found at MIT's Sloan School of Management. And he has taught at the Sloan School for over 30 years. Um, Bill has served as a leadership advisor, educator, and architect of systems transformation for CEOs of both startup and global corporations, fund managers, development professionals, national policy and political leaders, and prime ministers. <laughs> he has facilitated dialogue across a variety of contexts, including global energy executives, which I'm sure we'll be talking a little bit about, and policy leaders, senior political leaders across Southeast or South Asia, uh, union leaders, and ministers in national cabinets. He has also designed and guided the reform and transformation of large systems in both companies and national government agencies involving tens of thousands of leaders across multiple geographies. So a real change maker in our world today using dialogue. Um, so Bill, as a, as a first question, um, dialogue, since we really got started in the late 80s, early 90s, has come to mean a lot of things to a lot of different people, of course. Um, so going back to basics, uh, tell us what you feel um, from your uh, point of view is the essence of dialogue. Okay, I'll endeavor to do that. I also just want to say hello and welcome to everyone. Uh, some old friends and uh, and new. Uh, it's a pleasure to be together and um, to connect with everybody. Um, the the it's a, it's, a, it's an interesting one. It turns it seems to be the case that um, there are many different understandings of this term. Um, many different ideas. Um, traditions and so on. And so I'm going to endeavor to speak about uh, one that's been actually pretty steady in my experience for since early or in the early 80s. Um, and perhaps we'll go into the, the origin story, as it were. But uh, the gist for me is uh, 
something very simple. And I, I put it in the first book, which is dialogue is a conversation with a center, not sides. It's a conversation with a center, not sides. The gist of that is very simple um, to state and often not so easy to produce. I mean, the experience most people have when they engage together is we're talking to each other and we're talking, we're focused on some kind of interpersonal engagement. And I think this is because there's been an enormous, the enormous victory, if that's the right word for it, of the of humanistic psychology and the idea that, um, you know, what matters is the quality of interpersonal relationship and that if things are going well, we have that working right. And if they're not going well, it's going wrong. And the goal is to get that right. And, uh, and dialogue isn't about that. What's slightly confounding to folks is that it isn't really about that at all. Not in my, in my experience anyway. Uh, it's about creating an exchange where something that's present among everyone could emerge a whole larger than the sum of the parts. And while there is certainly an interpersonal dimension, uh, that's not the focus. And uh, perhaps that's something that gets needs to get um, explored more fully. But, you know, what, what does it mean to have a center and not sides? It means we're interested in something that is common and that is evoked, could be evoked through the exchange everyone has, as opposed to uh, the point of view any one person carries. So yeah, I'll stop for a second and see how you, what you think. I can go on for a bit. I don't know if you want to um, uh, stop. Yeah, let, let, me, uh, let, let me say, first of all, I like that very much that it's a center without sides. Um, I haven't heard it said that way, and that, that rings true to me, or it rings helpful to me in a way. Um, and I also like very much the idea that it's, some, that, that it's something that is present in everyone. So both of those ways of thinking about it, I think are, um, uh, uh, frame it a little bit differently than it's, than it's ever been framed in my mind. So I, I thank you for that. Um, uh, for that, I'm, I'm going to hold on to most of those things. Um, so I guess the question then, Bill, is, is, is how do you create that? How do you, how does that get, you know, what do you do? <laughs> Maybe it's the question. How, how do you make that happen? That this, this center, uh, that, that something emerges that everyone has in common. Well, let's, let, I think that'd be good to go into. I think there's two directions to go into. One is what I would call the kind of worldview behind that statement. I think it's actually very helpful to ha understand the perspective that's behind it and therefore okay. what dialogue is seeking to target. And I think, but in addition, uh, there's what one could call just the tactics. What do you do about that? And what's different? And I think there's actually a whole set of things one does that are actually quite different from sort of typical exchange. So let me start with the sort of worldview. Yeah, and, that, and that's good to start with that. I, I just recognize in myself that I'm all too interested and willing to move to tactics. So thank you for, uh, for moving us first into the worldview. Well, I think that a lot of us, I think one of the dilemmas of this is that it's very easy to talk about tactics and not actually, um, uh, I mean, some of us like to talk about the ideas and don't actually get into the tactics. And uh, that isn't actually as good, helpful either. Anyway, on the worldview front, um, the, there's a very simple idea here. And it for sure was articulated by David Bohm in our work with him in the early days, but it's uh, not, not just him. And this is the idea of an undivided wholeness. An undivided wholeness not as a metaphor, not as a, a kind of idea, but as an, the underlying structure of reality. There is an existing undivided wholeness and that any experience other than that is a function of how we have learned to participate with that reality. 
And we have various ways that we participate that mostly involve um, experiencing difference, experiencing fragmentation of various kinds. But the underlying nature of things isn't fragmented at all. And that what one is seeking to do in dialogue is recover a way of participating in that underlying wholeness such that it becomes um, accessible. Now, the challenge is the way we access it is through ourselves. So the vehicle, the accessing vehicle is our own consciousness. And it's also the vehicle or the, the thing that introduces distortion and complexity. So we're trying to perceive something with a vehicle, with a, with a mechanism that is itself somewhat compromised or is itself introducing um, uh, difficulty. So this is a dilemma and it raises the question, how do you, what do you do about that? I mean, part of what you do is you at least have the idea that this is the case. So one of the things we see is that there's many different challenges in the world. We see disturbance appearing. We see polarization dis appearing. We see fragmentation appearing in intensifying ways, right? The, the current pandemic is a sort of um, gigantic natural experiment in um, how leadership works. There's the same basic condition is being hit, is hitting every country and every region and every city in the world. And the way people are responding, the way leadership is responding, the way people are engaging is determining the result. It's quite extraordinary. Some places seem to be working, seems to be working quite well. There seems to be some coherence. Other places are out of control. Why? Right? It's the same same basic underlying condition. This is, the, this, is not, this is not a bad metaphor for as well as a kind of reality kind of what do you do about the distortions that appear in the world? And this is where dialogue has, this is another piece of the worldview. Dialogue has the potential of doing something further upstream, shall we say, about the factors that get introduced into the difficulty, in, into the situation. We need emergency medicine, you know, if, if you break your leg, somebody's got to set it. If, we're ha if we need work downstream in the difficulties that human beings face in whatever context it is, whether it's within a single organization or globally. But if all we ever do is work downstream, we're never going to change the situation. We're not going to address the factors that produce the difficulty in the first place. So it's very difficult to conceive of what would you do? Well, we need a way to shift this perceiving, participating collective mechanism called human consciousness. If we don't shift it, we'll continue to get what we get. I mean, that's actually, I think it's inevitable and I think inexorable. So part of the worldview is we need to figure out a way to step into this upstream zone. One of the more um, powerful things that we talked about some years ago was the idea that a change in meaning produces a change in being. A change in meaning can produce a change in being. This is a, uh, a phrase that Bohm spoke about, and it points to the idea that there is a subtle range uh, that is creating the experience we have, a subtle range of experience that is producing a more manifest range, subtle uh, as opposed to manifest. And that what we're interested in is this more subtle range. And there are a, a number of, op, of, of problems with how we get access to that subtle range. And dialogue can give us access to transforming the obstacles to that. So that's something perhaps we could come to. Um, so maybe I'll also say a little bit about the tactics uh, as well. I, I know I, I asked you to start with tactics uh, and so I'm going to change my mind now because what you just said I think is important. And, and you said we have to, I like the idea that you have to um, address it upstream. And so what I think you're saying is that one of the, one of the upstreams way we can address it is through dialogue. Are there other upstream ways <clears throat> to address this, this well, view that we have? Well, it's <clears throat> the issue is not the issue is not 
the issue is what do we do about the, the, the what do we do about the effects that appear? And what we're interested, what I think would be is interesting is to consider how to work upstream of the effects, how to work upstream of the effects. And the, the idea here is that we become aware of um, the, the rigidities or the uh, fragmentation that we ourselves are introducing into, we individually and collectively are introducing into the picture. And the, the, the issue here is creating a willingness to inquire uh, into these factors. In other words, it's, it's this, this, is a, this is pretty edgy stuff, right? This is, this is kind of saying, look, you know, we could, there's the old saying, right? Is if you're not part of the, part of the problem, you're part of this, part of the problem, you're part of the, you can't be part of the solution. I mean, we're all part of the problem in that sense. But the question is, how do we collectively learn how to move upstream? And I think this requires a certain security, a certain confidence, because it begins to invite everybody to loosen their grip on what they think is the right thing to do. By definition, their, their, their proposal, whatever it is, is emerging out of their, their, the, the very ground that itself needs to shift. So while it may in, the, in season turn out to be the right thing, initially it, it needs to be released. So we're beginning to participate in, a, in some kind of inquiry that isn't following what any one person advocates other than a process of inquiry itself. You know, so, I mean, I think, I think this gets more clear as one looks more at the tactics, actually. Um, so, so what, in, when you say, I just want to make one... Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Comment or question. So when you said it requires more it requires security and confidence, it seems to me you're also to let go of those, those views. It seems to me it also requires humility. <clears throat> well, it requires a number of things. I mean, this is one of the dilemmas also, which is that... Um, to, to work in this way uh, very quickly starts to pull the rug out from the certainties that one might bring to the table. Now, if one is identified with those certainties, you know, and it holds them deeply, then that, is a, that can make one a bit nervous. You know, I think this is one of the dilemmas, which is that we, ident we identify ourselves um, with our points of view. And, you know, to say, well, you should just let that go. It's not, that's not so simple. Uh, it's not so straightforward. Um, in, a, in a funny way, we're, we're wanting, we're also wanting to surface whatever it is that's present. We want to be transparent about what's present. So we don't want to hide it. So there's humility like, well, what I think doesn't, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter or whatever. It's like, no, actually, what's moving in you, we want to be transparent about that. We want to see how does it work. So that, that's where I come to back to sort of a, a ground of confidence um, where one can be relaxed about this kind of inquiry. Uh, and therefore, and it, it very quickly becomes quite intense. Uh, you know. So what I'm hearing, Bill, is for that relaxed um, atmosphere to happen, we're really talking about building a safe container where personal identity can not only come to the fore and in some ways be released because you're really trying to pick or to develop more of a shared identity, right? Through whatever is being looked at upstream. <clears throat> well, I think that, again, I think these are both, these are terms that sort of deserve a, a, a sort of exploration. So for instance, um, one way I angle into this is to say, well, what are the obstacles to this? What gets in the way? Right. And I think Bohm uh, articulated very precisely one of the obstacles, which is the, the nature of thought. We had this saying, right? I had this saying, thought creates the world and then says I didn't do it, right. right? The nature of thought and the system of thought collectively held. That's one of, I think, four barriers, four obstacles. Another one is a reflexive, an early, I think another one is a reflexive resistance to simply letting things be as they are. 
In other words, there's a tendency in all of us to want to rearrange things to be some other way than the way they are. And we do that in various ways. Sometimes we try and force it. Sometimes we try and co -whip, coerce people. Sometimes we manipulate, whatever. But it takes a bit of work to come to the notion that maybe things just are the way they are. So that, that, are, that itself is kind of, I mean, whatever that even means, of course, there's a, you know, how do you perceive it? But, but there's a kind of story that, and a story that runs in most of us, which is that, that it needs to be something, some other way. So there's a barrier there. There's one at the level of thought. There's another one that you've also indicated, which is basically a sense of isolation. The, the underlying dominant experience people have is that they're on their own. You know, not an experience of undivided wholeness, actually the opposite. They're alone. And while they may hold to a belief, they don't always, not everyone anyway, some people obviously have a different experience here, but the, the experience of feeling isolated, of feeling separate, obscures an under something else. And so that something else can be revealed through the emergence of a quality of atmosphere that allows connection to some wider experience of wholeness. The word container is also one that's used in this regard, but it, it's, it can get also kind of confusing. I think there are strong and weak settings everywhere, settings of varying strengths, let's put it that way, that allow this experience to be present or don't allow it to be present. Present in each one and present, present in personally and present collectively. And that what's missing and needed, another threshold to cross here, is the creation of fields in which this kind of perception becomes possible. On the identity front, um, I, I think it's also, that's an, that's an inquiry to be had. I think there are many different constructed narratives that people carry that I'm going to suggest are partial identities as opposed to whole. And they have this kind of annoying tendency of presenting themselves to us, forget others, as if they are us, these partial identities. And this is a very big subject and, a, another, and one and perhaps we could go into after the tactic territory if we get there. But the, um, it, 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 you know, what, I'm, what I think is important, the essence of what I'm getting at here is I think we have a lot of language about all this stuff and that what's needed is a kind of inquiry into each of these things. What do we mean by this stuff anyway? What's our experience of it? And, and to, to release, suspend our thought about it, mm -hmm. you know, however well developed. This is particularly challenging, I suppose, for people that spend a lot of time thinking about this stuff. So we have a particularly well developed set of ideas about this stuff, all of which is in a funny way, kind of irrelevant, you know, because what we're interested in is an experience of an inquiry that takes us past whatever we thought we've developed. This notion, right, of uh, the intellect as being a kind of a screen. We use this image of a very, think of it a finely woven mesh where insight is the breeze that goes through the screen. No amount of finely woven idea will ever capture what we're pointing to here, right? So creating a space in which we're inquiring into that breeze, into the breeze, uh, is part of what I think we're after here. And I think that will produce downstream changes and practical changes. We can get to that too. That certainly was the case. Well, I thought you really demonstrated that well in that article about Southeast Asia, what you were able to accomplish there, because you really started with uh, their identity being that um, with respect to national identity. And it wasn't until they could go into that where they saw that it was their national identities that were keeping them from forming a larger whole, that they could all then see a vision within. That seemed to me to be the, the kernel of your work there. Well, the, it's interesting, the, 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 that part of the world 
I mean, I, I, we speak, everybody says it's an old part of the world. I mean, the whole, all parts of the world are old. <laughs> you know, it's kind of a funny saying, actually. But there is a memory in South Asia, in, uh, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, in India, in Bhutan, in Nepal, in uh, Bangladesh, of being one place. There's a memory. It's amazing. And there's thousands of years where, three, three or 4,000 years, where it was very much one place, even with tribal barriers. And it's in the last, you know, 75 years, thanks to the Lord Mountbatten and a few others, that it got divided and then divided again. So there have been lots of conflicts, but the dream of, of a wholeness in the community was there. What's interesting is even that is actually quite partial, right? That's still, we're all South Asians. Yeah. I mean, that, the fact that that was present in them made it actually quite easy to call everyone to recognize that not only were their national identities not really who they were, their roles weren't who they were, their national identities really weren't who they were, but none of it in the end mattered. They were simply people being together. And it, that understanding emerged actually quite clearly among a core of about six or seven of them, ten, maybe eight or nine of them, if I'm, depending on my, how you think about it, maybe eight or nine. Um, they recognized they were holding a space for something beyond even South Asian right. patterns of identity. So it, 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 once you get the idea that you're releasing a certain grip on a limited framing, well, then you're not so interested in putting a new one on. Right, which really took them out of sort of that conflict of national identity and allowed them to open to a much larger reality that could really lead to something, some breakthrough. Well, it did, and it, it allowed a line, it, it, out, it allowed a coalescence. And so it allowed a coalescence and an understanding that we were playing a very different game. We weren't playing the game, a game called fix the problem of uh, uh, trade imbalances in the region, although we were. We were, we were working on the underlying factors that have led to all these difficulties not being addressed for 30 years, despite the fact that they were, quote, policy papers and proclamations from summits from every country and every, every capital for years. And no, yet no one did anything. So we had a very honest conversation about that. Well, what, if this is all so obvious, why aren't we doing anything about it? And I think it was that led to moving upstream. What is it? I'm calling moving upstream. What is it about how we're functioning uh, that's prevented us from doing this? And that th that opened the door. One more question just on your experience there. You obviously were quite successful in breaking through the national rigidities and opening to, lo to the larger vision. It took five years to do that. Tremendous uh, amount of focus on that. What's happening now? Have they been able to maintain the dialogues? Um, well, or yeah, yeah. Well, it's, a couple of things happened. What's interesting is that it happened within the first two hours. I mean, it, it didn't, it didn't have, it, there's a funny thing about this. It happened like that. Like for, for whatever reason, uh, within the first two hours of the first meeting in Thailand, it was in Thailand because we couldn't find a neutral place to meet. So we had to meet somewhere that wasn't in somebody's backyard, which is a whole negotiation all by itself. And we go into the factors that had to be present to allow there to be enough security, back to that word, so that people would relax. Um, there are a number of things we did. This is, we'll get to that perhaps in the tactics department in a bit. Um, within a very, these were all people. So these are very senior people, all of whom known each other in official context for years. And you interact in these kinds of policy contexts in, with lots of minions around and lots of formal apparatus, right? Formal structures, uh, you know, sm speeches that your staff has produced that you're supposed to stay and microphones and people listening and taking notes and all this kind of stuff. So we got rid of all that and we put them in a circle. <clears throat> they all knew, and, and, they, and most of them knew at least two other people in the room. So there was a, a level of friendship and connection and familiarity and we'd work with them all in advance. So they knew the game we were seeking to play and gave them all a chance to engage. <clears throat> but they came very quickly to recognize, oh, 
we can talk here. As simple as that. Oh, we can talk here. It, it, it didn't take time. It was mm -hmm. instant. Now, it, it, we, it, we gradually expanded in, in many different directions, and I won't go into all the detail, but we continued for about five and a half years. And last, the, 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 in that first phase of things, the last meeting was in Islamabad with a whole crew of Pakistanis welcoming everyone there, including a whole lot of Indians, which was itself quite extraordinary. And then there was about a two year hiatus. Uh, and then the whole thing's restarted. And I'm not involved in this cycle, this part of it, although some of my colleagues are, including uh, one I'm working with quite closely now. And it's going, it's not in its ninth year and going strongly. And we initiated a whole lot of things in it, regularized things. So for instance, all the power ministers in South Asia, you know, meet now quarterly as a group across the region to create a South Asian energy grid because there needs to be one and there hasn't been one and there are all kinds of reasons for that. And there's equally regular meetings around ecosystems issues and the monsoon and sharing weather data and trade issues and so on, as well as a whole lots of other kinds of projects. So without going into the details, it's like overly into the details. It's, it, it not only has it sustained the spirit of it, it seems to be quite alive and well. That's so, Bill, we have about uh, 10 minutes left before we break people into groups. And then, of course, we'll have some time afterwards. But can I push you a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> Is it time for tactics? <laughs> um, okay, well, uh, let me say a couple of things that are just contrasts on that front. Because I think one of the things that's one of the things I realized and we realized recently is that it's very easy to take for granted if you've been at this for a while, you kind of assume stuff without actually thinking very carefully about, well, what, are, what am I doing? And does it, why does it matter? So here are a couple to give you a sense of it. One is um, the conversation with the center, not sides, has a very practical implication, which is you speak to the center. It's, it's a little more, this, comes, this is coming across a bit more crudely than is actually the case, because you do, of course, speak with each other, but you're speaking it's, it's, it's meant to interrupt the idea that we're having an interpersonal exchange where I have to be polite to respond. And if I ignore what you say, I'm making an error. We're going to, in a dialogue, we're going to suspend that rule. So if you speak, you're not requiring other people to speak to what you said. You're not requiring a social response. And more deeply, you're not requiring uh, obedience. If you speak, often the assumption is people will listen and follow what I say, implicitly or otherwise. You're not just, often people are just ad for offering something. They want people to follow them. And the more extreme version of that is they want them to obey. They want them to do it. Well, we're going to drop that in dialogue. We're going to say, well, no, actually, we're not going to require that. We make an offer. So this is where the awkwardness comes. Well, what if no one says anything? Well, Let's see what happens. So that's the second thing. Another big thing here is that a lot of times you see a lot of difference, a lot of different, you know, people having kind of battles and so on. And the, you, the idea is let's find a common ground. Let's find, let's come to some kind of agreement. You know, let's find some areas of agreement. No, forget it. We may never agree. We don't need to agree. We don't need to agree release that requirement. What we're interested in is understanding what's present. Another one is we really quickly want to fix the problem. Let's figure out what the problem is and fix it. How about we explore what the problem is? We try and find the problem, not fix the problem. Um, another one is to focus on what we hold in common. How about we focus on what we don't hold in common? <laughs> How about we focus on what's present, whether it's in common or not? Um, another one is we often try and smooth over disturbances, like let's not get too upset here. How about we, in, not that not we amp up dis disturbance, but we just ex inquire into disturbance. What about that is disturbing for me? What tells, what does that tell me? 
What does that tell us? I mean, that is very, very, very delicate territory. But if one can hold the lightning of that kind of thing, it transforms the whole thing. It transforms. I mean, one quick story from South Asia on this front. It was a Nepalese guy, finance minister, uh, finance secretary, who was complaining to the Indian foreign secretary that both of them are lovely human beings, that India was charging Nepal for electricity uh, for years. And so there could be no power trading agreement between Nepal, which was short on power, load shedding 18 hours a day, which is now finally ended. In India, you had lots of power, but would, would offer to invest, but it, the in, Nepalese wouldn't take it. And the Nepalese, the, the Nepalese guy said, well, look, you had all these clauses in the so-called power trade agreements that would charge us extra money for all this power. And A, we thought this was always a way of your sort of sneaking up on us and trying to take advantage of us. And we didn't want to have you do this. And the Indian guy said, well, we would never have enforced any of those things. And in the atmosphere that we had, this finance guy, the finance secretary said, well, why the heck did you put him in there? And the Indian, it struck him. I don't know. It, it hit him that the Indians had a certain kind of arrogance about how they were dealing with their neighborhood that had, that had never really hit him. And he realized he'd been part of that, propagated it, and saw the impact that it had had and how it had stalled, actually for decades, any kind of shared agreement. And they released it right then. So this comes to very practical things, but you have to sort of have at it a little bit in an atmosphere where people can say what they think, and then they start to discover things that they might not have otherwise seen. So, so perhaps that's... Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, we have just a few minutes and I'm dying to ask the question of kind of, since you've been in the field for as long as you have, and you've worked both in the corporate sector and also in the public sector. I'm kind of curious where you see dialogue these days kind of moving, like what's its largest potential right now from your standpoint? And I noticed uh, you're also working uh, in the climate change field, which interests me a lot. So I'm kind of curious about the broader implications for where dialogue has its potential. Well, I think, I think what we need is more, um, a clear understanding of what this is and what it isn't as broadly as we can get it. Because I think, I think we're now in situations where our habitual ways of dealing with things are evidently not working. You know, we're not gonna think our way out of this. We're not gonna craft a new policy that's gonna, gee whiz, COP26 is gonna work. It's not gonna happen, yeah. right? And we're running out of time, so we hear. So we need to develop the capability. In my mind, one place this is going is we need to build the capability to understand that there is, in fact, an accessible way to address these issues. It's not actually that hard. It's not. Not, but we have to get a clear idea of what it is and what it isn't, right? And it's a little bit subtle because it because we all have relatively well developed ideas. Well, we're going to go fix a problem. Not, well, no, not going to help if we do that. It was very interesting to watch, to give you, so where, where it's going, I think, is uh, developing that skill at every level. So one, one, one quick anecdote to end this part of it, perhaps. We're in uh, uh, Sri Lanka and uh, we had a, a dialogue process going. We'd been building a vision of how South Asia could unfold that we were sharing. And we had a, a some, there had been some Pakistani involvement, but. The Pakistanis and the Indians have a little history of pointing nuclear weapons at each other and being tense. We, we know something about this, right? And the, the, one of the one, one very senior Pakistani fellow had been participating, but many of the others, many others that we were wanting to involve hadn't, hadn't actually been so sure. And finally, five of them showed up in this meeting in, um, uh, uh, in Sri Lanka for very senior people. And they had a meeting at breakfast before the meeting where they were huddling together. So he said, well, there they all are. They're probably making a plan. I said, they were, they were like, well, we need to do something about how to integrate. Them. I said, no, we don't. This is a, this conversation is in, unfolding the way it does. They'll, when they come in, we just include them, that's it. 
And we did. And it was within very few hours, it was as if they'd all been there the whole time. Fast forward, that led to them inviting us to all come to Islamabad, which is itself not an easy place to get to. Uh, but we did it. In that meeting, um, a whole lot of people came that we hadn't anticipated, and which was fine. But one particular lovely woman from WHO, ironically, showed up and, and spoke. And one of the things that people in these kinds of contexts do is they make what I'll call little speeches. They kind of, they say, they get the floor and they say their three points. Well, my first point, I have three points. Da, 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 da. And it fell, it, it, it landed like a complete lead balloon in this, we had a series of concentric circles. Uh, maybe when we come back from the break, I'll, 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 I'll show a little picture of it to give you a feel for it. And it just went thud. You know, and it, she's a lovely person, she had, but she did not know what we were doing. So one of the Pakistani guys, this very senior foreign foreign minister came to me after the meeting, after at the, one of the breaks, he said, Bill, we really should brief people before they come to these meetings. She really didn't know what we were doing. And I thought, that was you two months ago, you know. But what became clear is the spirit of it, it was instantly gettable. You know, could he articulate every aspect, you know, in some clever way? I don't know. Probably, actually. This guy's pretty smart. But who cares? He got the vibe of it. He got it. And there was no teaching, seminar, train, nothing. Never, I never once taught anybody anything about any of this, actually. We just did it. That was a whole other subject. You know, we think we have to teach. I didn't do it. We didn't, it wasn't the thing to do in that context. Anyway, I th so I think where this is going is we need to find a way to accelerate that kind of transmission and experience because I think it is very built. I think it's we're built. I think it's inbuilt. The equipment for this is why we're wired for this. This isn't like we have to install it. It's there. We just have to turn it on. Thank you, Bill, for for that. And and um, we're, we will now move into small groups, and you'll probably be in a group as well, okay. Bill, the way okay. we do it. So okay. there are groups of four. Bobby's going to move us. And you'll be in that group for about 20 minutes. You'll have a one-minute warning when the group is mm -hmm. over, then come back. Uh, we're not asking you to report out uh, from the group at all, uh, but we will then invite people to comment if they want, either in the chat or to comment uh, in person. Uh, and, and we'll take questions, um, more questions for Bill at that time as well. So, uh, Bobby, if you will do your thing and move us into groups. So we're back. Linda, are you back? I don't see her. Yep. Muted. Yeah. Linda, are you muted? I'm sorry, I am muted. Yeah, I was trying okay. to leave them up here, here on the top left. <laughs> um, so what we're going to do now is go through a um, about a half hour of questions, answers, comments. Um, and so how we do that, because we are so many, is if you could put uh, some just a couple of lines um, uh, of what your question might be or what your comment might be, and Nancy and I will call on you and we'll ask you to then articulate that to Bill so that he can comment. Um, and, and we'll give you a couple of minutes to, to put what you want in the chat. You can keep going after that, but let's take just a couple of minutes. And I've typically tried to play music during that time, so I'm going to try it again, see if I can manage that. Uh, I know I tried the first time and my music selection was terrible, so. Nancy's got that down a little better. Yeah, I've got the music lessons. Just can I make it play? All right, let's see. Oh, good. Can you hear it? Very nice.
So by the time I finally got the screen stopped sharing and the music's going the right volume, it, <laughs> it's all over. I've got to get more technical here. But Linda, go ahead and, and uh, have, have you seen a first question you want to ask? So I'm going to ask Lloyd to share his questions about the four barriers to wholeness. Uh, Lloyd, are you there? Make sure you're not muted. Okay, unmuting. Yeah, well, we discussed this in our breakout, and we all started out by saying there were four barriers, and the three of us in our breakout could only remember him describing <laughs> three. To so see and, if you're paying attention, you see. <laughs> yes, and the three were the system of thought, uh, the reflexive resistance to accepting what is, and the sense of isolation. Right, you're, the fourth one, uh, has to do with amnesia around an, an obscuring of a deeper sense of being by partial identities. The, 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 you know, the, the, the notion that arises, the experience that arises in us that, I mean, you get access to this, uh, you can see this in action in yourself by thinking about something you react to. You see a reaction in yourself. I don't like this. I don't like that. Whatever. It's, and there's. It's not just physic. It's not. It's physical, emotional, men, intellectual. You know. You see stuff, and it's a part of you acting that, for the moment, becomes. Uh, you know. Some people jokingly call this an amygda hijack, but it's a. You're. It's a part of you acting that is, at, pretending, presenting itself, fusing itself with, you. And to a high degree, um, it's, very, it's very easy to get convinced that it's true. Um, that this is, in fact, me speaking, but it isn't. It's a part of you. It's not you. It's a part of you. Different. Very different. Massively different. And the, that sub, that sub program, however you want to, there are various metaphors that one could apply here, um, obscure what might be behind it and so there's a there's a whole uh inquiry to be had about that and what is behind it and why is that other sort of uh call it false identity representing itself as you and why are we why are we falling for it and what do we do about it that's the that's the last and deepest i mean they're all interconnected arguably but they're distinct and I think we articulated this, I think Bohm's articulation of the system of thought stuff appears to be the whole story, and it isn't. There's more to it. Certainly a critical piece. I ask Claudia if she'll ask her question, because I think it relates to that. She has the question around isolation. Claudia, would you unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah. Hi. I was wondering, um, you spoke about isolation and how this somehow contributes to fragmentation because people yeah they just feel alone so i was wondering in our current situation people feel even more isolated which probably contributes to this feeling of fragmentation as well and with that dialogue might be more important than ever but i was wondering how we can overcome this huge feeling of being alone and yeah getting dialogue maybe also more in our everyday life in order to help with that. Right. Um, I guess the, the, the key to this, in my, in my experience, is where the feeling of isolation comes from. And um, so, you know, you can certainly be with a lot of people and feel quite isolated, right? It's not, doesn't, tr turns out it doesn't actually have that much to do with who you're with. Um, it, it, it might. You know, if you're, you know, and, and, and I don't, it, partly this depends on um, somebody who told me that Rudyard Kipling talked about the fact that there are inside men and outside men. He was in an age when it was just men, inside women and outside women. In other words, some of us just need to be out in the world, you know, and some of us are trapped in our houses and are going a little nuts. You know, uh, for some of us being trapped in our houses is actually a great relief, not getting an airplane for five and a half months, whatever it is. You know, it's like I could not have asked for something better. Um, but I think the, the separation, isolation, 
quality is at the level of the field in which one functions in oneself. It's a, it, it works at the level of the field within one's own consciousness first. So the transformation of it starts there. I mean, this is the, the ability to offer and evoke or catalyze an experience of quote container with another, with a group of people is dependent on your own quality of that within yourself, right? You can't join a dialogue group looking for a container because then it's a whole lot of people looking for something. Nobody's got it. Nobody knows what they're, you know, it's a little bit chaotic. I mean, you might touch something, but you don't necessarily know what you're touching. So I think this is a, a, a pattern of healing or shift at the level of uh, the tone or field within oneself. You know, where does that, so, and, and this also is, it's related to the other levels, the other four levels. So who is it that thinks she's alone? Right? I, I mean, I, you know, you'd say, well, not you. You're not alone. You're not isolated. Not actually. If undivided wholeness is the reality, we're not alone. If you're experiencing, or some part of one is experiencing being alone, then the interesting thing is to not just try and suppress that, or fill it, or distract it, but to ask, you know, and the operative question is often, a really useful question is, how do you feel toward that part of you that feels alone? Not how does that part feel, but how do you feel toward that part of you that feels alone? It immediately makes clear there's you, and there's the part that feels alone. And then you can begin to offer something to it, so it doesn't feel so alone anymore, you know, and that's a starting point. I mean, there's other levels here, but that's a sort of what occurs. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Bill. Uh, Lauren, uh, there's so much going on, obviously, in the U.S. with respect to race. I'd love you to pose your question to Bill. I think it's very apropos. Sure, thanks. And um, thanks, Bill. It's a really lucid presentation. I've um, read your book on dialogue, and I've written my own book recently on civic dialogue, but still uh, found myself scribbling notes. So, yeah, my question, um, I live in on the North Shore in Beverly, so about 95% white, um, and we're trying to bring in some dialogues about race. And while I, I love the point about um, not trying to fix the problem, but find it, I'm just wondering how that might sit with either people of color or even white people that just feel like, I know what the problem is, it's racism. I'm not going to a dialogue if you don't admit racism is a problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Well, <clears throat> I mean, we, we've <clears throat> been exploring this a little bit in our, our community and our gang too. Um, I think it's, it's, uh, um, I mean, if someone is in a, in a, a lot of this has to do with the, the quote, upstream preparation of the, you know, of the space, the invite, the quality, the invitation, who's doing what, inviting, who's inviting whom to what, All right? If the feeling people have, say, is that they're being invited to uh, help white people not feel guilty if they're black, that's not going to go so well. And, and if they're being invited to be helped to see that they're being re unreasonable, that doesn't go so well either. So there's a sort of, um, what's the motive? Is it a really interesting question is why would one bother to do this? Kind of try it. What is one's motive, right? And I think there's a lot of um, uh, talking to the usual suspects kind of stuff that's gone on where we're talking to ourselves. We're not actually so good at noticing that there's a ton of depth uh, in context, other contexts that we're not so familiar with and being curious about what is interesting to them, you know, as opposed to trying to help or shed one's guilt or whatever. Um, I, I, none of that's going to help <laughs> is the problem. As well motivated, it, as well intended as it is, I don't think it's going to do much. You know. Anyway, I don't know if that's helpful, but it is the underlying motives are really important. Um, and it's really challenging stuff. I mean, you know, to understand and appreciate the level of woundedness. I mean, part of part of what's shocking to people of color 
is how shocked the white people are at what's going on. They're kind of like, really? Did you really not get this? This is an American in particular. If you're not in North America, it's a little bit different. But they're kind of going, really? Are, are you actually surprised by all this? Where have you been? You know, it's that's the shock for them. You know, so, you know, in the kind of like, you know, so one colleague of mine said, everybody's heard of Kent State in the United States. Hardly anybody's heard of Jackson State, where the exact same thing happened, right? Why? Because there's a narrative that systematically excludes, you know. So anyway, the fact that that's where wake, that everybody's sort of getting that is itself useful. But if we all fall into a pattern of guilt and shame and so on, or, or try and get everybody to behave a certain way, we're not going to get anywhere. That's not going to help. Anyway, I don't know if that helps. It's tricky territory. Yeah, yeah, thanks. And um, any any thoughts on sort of maybe starting with white only dialogue just to I mean, that it, might be easy. I mean, I'd say it's I'd say I'd look at who's who's interested. Who wants to, yeah, start with where there's, start with what you're curious about. I mean, I, I would start with your own, your own motive and your own, what, and what, what, what part of you is animated and why is it animated? And what is it, what is it, what's the genuine offer, you know, and then see who, see who responds. I mean, it might well be a, a, a very simple, a very unobtrusive thing, but if it's genuine, it'll, it'll grow, right? Susan, um, and I don't, I can't possibly pronounce your last name, Susan, to start with the T, Jasu, maybe, um, it has a question that really kind of follows on that question, I think. Uh, so maybe I'll ask her if she'll come forward and unmute herself. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Can I see? Yes, yes, hello. Yeah. Uh, so I'm just Sort of in our own breakout room, um, Cliff and I had spoken about this, trying to move away from that idea of strategic dialogue. So, because I work a lot in you know, mediation and conflict resolution, so like, and now I do a lot of consulting. Um, I actually just started this right before pandemic, um, where we do a lot of consultations for um, engineering inclusion, but in the idea of using the dynamic systems theory, um, sort of the work that was generated from Colombia. Um, and using that to sort of transform spaces. And for me, it's always been a strategic where you have an open statement, you have sort of that structural process. Um, and I'm just kind of wondering how you sort of navigate that in a very generative process where you're just trying to get people to, first of all, just even see the value of, the con of having a dialogue um, and how like, do you have a shared agreement or, you know, what are the, any basic structures that go into creating um, that space for people to really um, dive into a generative process of just understanding or getting comfortable with driving a conversation? Um, yeah, I'm not, I mean, I think, I'm not sure I, um, I'm not sure this is going to be responsive, but what I what I'm what I typically try and do is is ask what is the what is it everybody's concerned about what is the, what is it they want what are they interested in um, you know what are they trying to have happen um, and uh, what is in the way of that happening um, and then and and saying look what if we could explore what you're what if we there were a way to explore what you're trying to have happen um in a way that actually enable us to see underneath so getting some progress on it what if we could do that and it, in very it's hardly ever do they say well no that wouldn't be interesting you know and and i think that's the offer it's like well what are you in, what are they interested in having happen you know and like linda asked about the climate space we are starting to do a little bit of work in that and the you know it's a fraught mess of ideas but in the end what people are after is a way to make progress in an in an in a otherwise stuck off a quite stuck situation right and where there's no silver bullet 
there is no one thing that will fix this, you know, despite what anybody sort of is assist, insisting it isn't. Um, but what if there were a way to find connection among people that normally wouldn't play together, wouldn't engage together, where everybody comes out ahead and where new set of possibilities could emerge? What about that? What if we could explore that? Etc. So I set. I think the ambition is to set something up that, it, that connects to something they're curious about and want, would like to see work better. So it keeps it very simple and very practical. I don't know if that's helpful, but that's this. You know, and then and then and then it's like, well, then there's a bunch of things that have to happen after that. But that's the sort of starting point, maybe. Uh, John. That, that yeah. Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, Johnny Drury has an interesting question. Kind of will take us into a different. Um, different um, path around uh, uh, younger people. Johnny, do you want to express your question? Slender. Um, hi, Bill. Great to be here. Hi, John. Um, yeah, I'll, um, it was somebody, it, it was um, Claudia who spoke earlier, who was in, in our little group, um, who's, I don't think she might be saying she, she works with, young, with youngsters. And um, she asked a question, which I, I've been and, and a few people I'm um, talking with are curious for a while, but I just haven't had the resources and time to, to get into it. But I really would like to work with young people eventually. And the question which is in my mind, and this, these stories that you've said, um, that you've told about, um, people that are able to drop all this conditioning, mental conditioning, in an instant. Um, it, it, there's something about that, about, about that that reminds me of the child, child state that's unconditioned mind. So I was wondering if you apply dialogue to children, is there a difference in what you're actually challenging there? If, if you get my question, because yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I think it depends on the age and stage of the kid, right? Like, like children from up to, I mean, it depends. This is a big topic, right? But like, I have two little kids who are very. They are in the immediate contact with what you could call primary process all the time they're just in it right and they don't um you know the problem the challenge of how you quote socialize them <laughs> um so that that they don't lose connection to that is is a non-trivial one mm -hmm. you know how and it's different for boys and girls right you know the the saying here is if you can keep protect a boy's heart until they're four there's a friend of mine named Carol Gilligan from Harvard who has a lovely bit of research on boys and girls in development. Basically, if you can protect a boy's heart until he's four, actually protect it. The odds are good that he'll keep his heart open. And for girls, it's um, by the age of 11, it seems, they have to decide whether the world can take them as they are. I've said this to many different people. <laughs> it gets, gets that basic reaction like, oh. <laughs> I mean, it's really interesting. Boys are very emotional. Little boys are super emotional, you know, little beings, which for many cultures is a really bad thing. And people try and stomp it out as quick as possible, which is tragic. And I think we've got a lot of the violence we have in the world because of it, actually. Um, and with girls, it's a very different thing, which is, you know, can the world take me as I am? Girls by the age of 11 who are as a clear, often as clear as any beings on the planet, can have basically figured that out, whether the, the answer is yes or no. Then they have to figure out what to do about that. So it's kind of once those developmental junctures are crossed or not crossed, depending, you, 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 then it depends on what have you got. But in the end, it's always about creating a field in which the factors that are actually present, not the ones that you want to be present, but the ones that are actually present, um, are, access, are accessible. Are, can be can be seen and, and often of course we all those are hidden right people keep them back because it's typically not safe to bring out the more delicate factors that are present so people are wisely careful um, 
consciously or not, sometimes unconsciously careful, etc. So children say, you know, and they, they can move, depending on how they've been handled some of these developmental things, and those are two little, I just gave two little brief illustrations, then, you know, so you have to navigate what's the present. But a lot of it is, you know, anyway, that's, well, that's helpful, I don't know. Thank you. Um, Annette has an interesting question, sort of around work, the idea of working upstream. Annette, can you unmute yourself? It, it was as much of just an observation and something I was leaning into from a sense of inquiry, the notion that there's even the subtle distinction between um, working work upstream at a higher level of consciousness at the more subtle, undivided whole collective versus working upstream, which takes almost Sisyphe Sisyphusian effort. So that was, that was what I was sort of just playing with for a little bit there. <laughs> You mean like trying to climb upstream or something? <laughs> yeah, like, so when, when you actually don't have a group that has a shared intention, right, or the motive is not clear or people are not explicit, right? And so the, and this, this came out of something that was showing up in our group, how hard it is sometimes to be the only one who is working again. So the example I gave was, if you looked at the, the example you gave us, which was with the screen, and you had the screen as a structure and then you had the wind going through it as the insight or the breeze going through it if people are willing one person might be thinking okay i'm thinking about the breeze going through while everyone else is thinking about the structure itself and the metal connections within the screen then that person who's trying to hold the space for the breeze going through it is a bit like sisyphus that person is working upstream to get people to shift their their perception it's kind of like when you see the old woman or the young woman What's the perception? What's your focal point? I, I was just playing with it. I didn't actually think it was going to get raised, but that's cool. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think that if one is finding something hard work, especially if you're trying to facilitate something, I think that's often the, a clue <laughs> that maybe one's heading in a direction that isn't helpful. <laughs> you know, like, like it, you know, you're, you're, you're struggling to get something to happen and maybe maybe what's needed is to release that struggle and see what's trying to happen anyway. I mean, I, I don't, I, it's, hard, it's hard to say. I mean, I don't, you, you, you can't, the breeze is blowing all the time. You can't stop it. Mm. You know, it's not up to us to try and direct it. It's more a matter of are we participating in it or not. And, and how we can be as impeccable as we can at, at allowing that to be the case, and, you know, including unblocking or dissolving whatever's in the way in ourselves. It's, it's a fundamental leverage point we have, is our own conditioned stuff. Um, you know, it's very easy to get interested in having to help everybody else with all their conditioning. <laughs> As, you know, that, that's kind of a Kind of a kind of a waste of time, really. I mean, it isn't. It isn't. I mean, it depends on the context. But anyway. Yeah, a related question. Um, it's also a question of tactics. There's a few other questions in the chat about tactics. Um, Zafnat, uh, why don't you uh, give Bill the scenario? I think many of us have had this kind of thing happen to us. It'd be wonderful to hear Bill's response about getting someone who just isn't focused on dialogue into the dialogue. Yeah, so I'm experimenting my theory and two decades of studying dialogue um, in a community in Portland. And I decided in the middle of my life to join a community to build a community. I was the first one here and then people started coming and we had a disagreement about the, the democratic process. Um, and um, I I came with whole, like trying to get into, as you said, the underlying wholeness and uh, looking at the center. But a couple of people, they are a real couple, um, uh, just rejected very fiercely, um, trying to blame and to accuse and using, uh, like harassing, using horrible language. 
um, and I'm not a facilitator. So um, I was working with a facilitator trying to bridge um, and, you know, provided the language that I know and my experience. Um, but it got to a point, they just refused to be in the center and to look at the wholeness and our, um, uh, and be intentional, really. Um, so it got to a point that um, one of us has to leave and prob probably I leave because I cannot live in such uh, conditions. So I was wondering if you have any tactical advice as to what do you do with all your knowledge when it comes to reality and there's no one to talk with? Well, I think it's a great, it's sort of life giving you kind of a great opportunity, oddly, right? Like, like yeah. painful, <laughs> but, but, but interesting. I mean, I think I don't, obviously, I don't know the situation so i i can't really say but what I, I could say is that what you know for sure um if people are feeling very emotionally feeling strongly emotion strong emotionally about something and reacting then the starting point is why are they reacting what are they reacting to what is bugging them right and not to try and talk them out of it or correct it or get them to play some other game. Just that, what, what's painful here? What's the injury? Simple as that, you know, it's like, how do you create a pattern of, you know, a, a space where you, you know, apology, heal, you know, like reactive energy is a form of oneness, right? It's not separateness. I, I think we can get quite addicted to that too. <laughs> you know. Um, it, it, so the, the issue is sort of well, what, what if, what if, you know, you could ask yourself, what have I done? That's what wittingly or not, what my I have done that's that's produced this that triggered triggered these people, right? And, they're, and they may or may not feel safe enough to say what's triggering them. They may be full of. <laughs> I know it's the problem is you, you know, whatever, you know, and you could say, well, then, then, you know, we got one of these things going on where, you know, so it's like, well, somebody has to do something else. You could be right. You could say, it could be me. That's very possible. <laughs> In fact, it's pretty likely. It may also, by the way, be you, but there's a starting point here, which is, it's for sure me. I mean, you know, anyway, I don't, I don't know, but I, I'd start with that. I'd start with why is this painful? You know, and, and what about it is so causes reaction in you and wants you to get them to operate in some different way, dropping all that completely. Um, it'll make space. I mean, it may be that there's other things going on here. Con confident there are other things going on besides all that. So I don't know what's shaking out, you know, but that's the just that help <laughs> yeah, that, 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 the time so maybe we should move into yeah thank you bill that, that last response particularly was uh, was uh, helpful to me because i can find myself sometimes in self knots place and 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 having the um the courage and the insight and the willingness to say um what what it what is what am i doing that in this situation that be, could be causing this is really the right question it seems to me so thank you You're um so so my uh so mostly i want just to thank you bill it's just been a real privilege for you to be on this uh series that we've had and and i've really been appreciative of your thoughtful response i've i, I i've all noticed so often that you speak uh, two things that I noticed. One is that before you speak, you, you're you often quiet and you think a little bit, <laughs> which, which I really appreciate. You don't jump in and start answering. And the second is that you often speak quite slowly, which, and sometimes repeat something, which, which I find very uh, useful. So I've been noting those, um, I guess, behaviors um, that I appreciate. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. It's it's been a great pleasure, and I I, uh, I sometimes I pause because I don't know what to say. 
I don't know. I don't know. I better think about it. Um, you know, or or I want to listen for what um, what what is trying to what the right thing is. You know, it 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 isn't immediate sometimes. Um, I've, I have to say, I really appreciate the quality of um, uh, in, interest and um, heart for all of this. It's a lovely thing and very evident, actually, you know, everybody. So very appreciative of the chance to do this with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so it's my pleasure to, to plug the next, uh, video, uh, next uh, interview we're going to have. Uh, in a month, and it's going to be with um, Elko Digis, which some of you may know, uh, a really special person, and uh, he can't be with us today. Usually we ask the, the uh, next interviewer to talk a little bit, but Elko has provided a video, so I'm going to ask Bobby now to play the video so he can explain exactly, or as best he can, what he's going to talk about during the next interview. So Bobby, if you'll do that for us. Well, Nancy, I thank you very much for that question and for the invitation to speak on the 14th of August. Um, I will share on the 14th of August a little bit about my view on dialogue, which is not only personally my view, it's also a little bit European. You could maybe say uh, German, Dutch, to put some emphasis on the importance of feeling and sensing when it comes to dialogue. So a lot of times we are talking about dialogue and we're talking about exchanging mental ideas, mental concepts, words, thoughts, and see how we can overcome our fragmented views or our fragmented positions. In them. Um, and of course, we all know that feelings are as important for the process of dialogue as our thoughts and our words are. Um, but we do not so explic explicitly put our focus on it. And that's what I want to do in that session on the 14th of August. Uh, to put some emphasis on, on the field of dialogue and how it feels to be part of that and how the quality of that feels, uh, field can be sensed. Now, this sensing the dialogic field, which is the title of what I will be talking about, uh, is, is an important capability for, for people who, who are in dialogue processes or facilitate dialogue processes. I facilitate a lot of dialogue processes in open groups in families and communities and in organizations. And of course, we sense this field all the time with our bodies. But to have some tools to do that in an explicit way and to use this, this sensing to get some information about the field, to feel what we want to bring in to the field, how we can be open about our inner processes. We need our feelings. And we do not only need our feelings for that, we also need our felt sense for a certain dialogic field to help the field move on. So when we can sense where a field gets stuck, or when we can sense an unknown possibility for a field, or when we can uh, use our, our intuition uh, to, to bring in something that can be important for the process to move on. It's, it's a very important, uh, helpful skill for dialogue. So. so that I will be talking about. I will be talking about dialogue as being a field between us, which we can sense into for which we use mostly our bodily perception. Then I'll lead you through an, an, an exercise which you can use very practically in every situation you're in when you facilitate dialogue processes um, to get access to this, this, this uh, capability, to the skill of sensing the field. Um, we will play with that exercise and then we will share it together about it. Now that's what I will do on the 14th. I also will bring in some of my music. Um, I use music a lot in dialogue because I think it opens up spaces 
fields, possibilities in our uh, common perception in our, in our, in, 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 to share something together, to make connections. Music can be very helpful and important. So I also share some of my music and I guess, I hope it will be a fun meeting then. So uh, I hope you all will join. I look forward to see you then, Nancy, and to see all of you. Thanks, Nancy. So um, for the last part, we're down to about 15 minutes left. Um, you, of course, and some people have already put a few things in the chat, but we'd like to just give people uh, just a few minutes until the top of the hour to um, just check out with any last reflections they might have. And there's a lot of us here. I don't particularly want to have to call on you because I've got two screens here. So um, maybe just let's just go slow and offer whatever spirit wants you to offer and uh, then allow the next person to come in. If you'd like me to call on you, I can try. <laughs> Linda, are you asking people to speak? Or are you yeah, asking I'm just asking speak? people to speak. Any last, uh, any last reflections right. you might have, whatever stood out that you'd like to offer to Bill um, or to the, the whole uh, group. One of the things that uh, came up for us in our small group and that um, feels like a thread that goes through even just the uh, uh, decision or to try and be in dialogue is the question of courage or the, the uh, you know, to step up, to speak out, um, to, you know, to convene, to try and get uh, people in the room who don't necessarily agree with each other. And you know that could be a dangerous space. and. and perhaps the norms of, you know, of whatever group you're in and that moment when you say, I'm going to say something, right, um, is an important moment and um, be honored. I, I, have a, I have a daughter who's, who's 19 and I, I I'm not sure. I think she's wondering about that question. Can the world take me as she is? Um, and my wife, I think, might have answered that question in, in the no. <laughs> so I'm left with that. Thank you. I'd like to say thanks for um, reminding us of the, uh, the, the moment where a fear way the possibility as a facilitator that nobody's going to speak because that happens a lot in in my field with uh in in autism dialogue and interestingly and poignantly um we often talk about those who cannot speak or will not speak and so and and the whole realm of advocacy and things like that it's um it's fascinating it, it's even today, this afternoon, in a session, um, to to experience the idea that actually language can be extremely dangerous, and so we are constantly hovering in between the world of language and and silence or expression manifesting the subtle, as you said, Bill. So thank you. Uh, I would love to come in. Um, hi, Hannah, based in South Africa in Cape Town right now. And I'm really sitting, um, there's a thread of things that have, been, that have come up that you've said and that other people have said in the small group around, you said, inquire into the disturbance, um, that dialogue is an opportunity to do that and not just to connect to what we have in common. And then you just said reactive energy is a form of oneness, not separateness. And it's really connecting me to some conversations we've had here in, um, in, uh, in Cape Town around the Dialogue Academy wanting to come and spread, you know, dialogue here and the sense that dialogue is uh, like a white thing to do. 
<laughs> and, and a thing that you do because you want to say kumbaya and hold hands and we want to everything to be okay and it's not okay and it's not okay and so the sense of really framing dialogue i really feel like dialogue has not been framed with how the emotion of anger of the emotion of, of frustration the emotion of just feeling the pressure of um, power on you. And I just think that um, the way that you, that, that dialogue needs to be framed based on the context that it's being um, practiced in. And I don't think that that's happening yet here in terms of the kind of global, the interest of dialogue and coming here, because there is a particular history of, of how dialogue has been experienced here by different people. And, and so I'm really curious, um, you know, well, this is not a Q&A anymore, but <laughs> I'm sitting with a curiosity around, um, uh, Bill, your experience of going into different contexts and how to frame dialogue in a way that resonates with, with, with more people than just those who are in power. Thank you. Reflections. I I would like to come in. I'm Daniela. I'm from um, Germany, and I'm with something. I want to thank you. Thank you for facilitating. Thank you for your your um, your talk, Bill. Um, and I'm um, with the fact you said at first. You said there are words and there are terms but what is really the meaning behind them and what are our experiences with them? Because um, we had the topic in the German um, group also, and um, we need the terms to talk, but what do they really mean and what do they really mean for everybody and how do we get behind mental talk? Um, they are needed, but yeah, that's something that's, on my mind right now and I want to thank you for that for reactivating that. Pleasure. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm, I uh, wanted to uh, sure. You can go ahead work go ahead Rockman. Rockman, I think you were you wanted to go. Yes, I yeah um I'm Robert Corman. I am interested in what it takes to get to a point of um, not just the agreement that can happen, which I've seen happen, um, even from exquisitely diverse a set of tensions. I'm very interested, and maybe it's another time, in what it actually then really takes to make a shared insights truly come to pass in a sustainable way. And so um, that question has been with me and it still is. Um, and I resonate so much with the heart and passion that's being shared here. Um, and it seems to me that this question that I have is really pretty crucial ultimately in understanding where dialogue fits and how it can become a larger dimension in, in the collective buy-in in the search for uh, in, enduring approaches for as long as they have real salience and viability. I thank you very much, Bill, for what you offer here in this world. Thank you. Thank you. So I have probably been enlightened in, in the area that I think haven't really been being touched on um, in years of seeing people do dialogue and working in a field of conflict and it's just the idea of isolation and, I, I'm, and you the way you frame it as a, a pretty question um, 
it's something I'm going to take with me. Um, and just that term that says, how do you feel towards a part of you that feels wrong? Um, and it's something that I, as I reflect on it, even <clears throat> with my own conflict intelligence, um, I'm sort of searching and processing, you know, areas in which when I'm learning and I'm teaching people to learn in some sense, when you're facilitating, um, there's elements of loneliness in there. And it's so, it's something that I just think I, I'm, I'm glad, like I said, Bill, this has been a very fulfilling time and I've not seen it being framed in such a way that that helps you mentally process it at the same time gives you a step further back to say, um, how does this make me feel? You know, um, because conflict intelligence is something that when you're in the field and when you go, you can sort of manage anxiety or you can be neutral or you can sort of play parts of your body into feeling neutral. Um, but you can't trick your brain mentally, no matter how much you sort of work on that in the moment. And I think I'm going to take that with me, if not anything, from this conversation. Great. And uh, building on that, among many things that I'm going to take away, is also from one of the stories that you shared where you said, I think it was probably India, Pakistan, or maybe Kashmir area, something like that, where you said, you know, but somehow people still have a, in their bones, they have a memory of when they were a whole, when they were still connected. Mm -hmm. So one inspiration that I'm taking with me as dialogue facilitator is, you know, how to evoke more of that. Because indeed, if we look back, you know, it's all right, it's 75 years, it means, you know, thousands of years, you know, so kind of, yeah, how to expand even this narrative in some ways, you know, like, like in terms of time or any other way. So there's this big question of, yeah, how to, how to soften, expand, shift, change narratives that we have so that they can really serve the future and connection. Thank you for a lot. Yeah, I want to thank you, uh, Bill. This is Chrissy from Germany. Um, I want to thank you for sharing your thoughts and your sensing with us. And I want also to thank you for the question, can the world take me as I am? <laughs> that touched me deeply and it helped me also to connect that this question is not only for 11 year old girl but also <laughs> for a woman and for older people and also it helped me to see that dialogue is also the field behind those questions mm. yeah and it's also the field between the question and the answer and it's also the field before, as Sharon said, before one speaks and the heart is beating. So thank you for sharing and um, um, informing us what dialogue in your views and experience is and what the field is about. And thank you all that we are here together. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Beautiful. That question, if the world will actually accept us as we are, it brings me to this point about how culture has expanded in terms of making us believe that we have to become something. Uh, in a world that permanently changes, which is ephemeral by definition, and to which this conditioning probably has also to do with our fragmentation. So uh, I want to thank you, Bill, and, and uh, Linda and Nancy for creating the space for, for and then for reminding me of so many things because it was your book which made me interested in the field of dialogue actually, Bill, 15 or 16 years ago. Uh, 
Mm. So, uh, and I just took it out of the library again because <laughs> every time, every, every, every time I, I hear you, it's inspiring and it, uh, it takes me back. It takes me back to this, to this reference work of you, of yours. So thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate seeing you again. I could add to something I was listening to in a hotel lobby in Berlin in the first part on a mobile, but I think I got it right when Bill talked about um, the, um, the point of not looking, searching for immediate solutions, but inquiry, inquiring into the question. And I think that's one of the main, main, main things I, I meet with people um, that that's a big shift to, to make clear and that from inquiry into the question and being together in this new way, new solutions will come up by itself without the need to jump to them immediately and to create this space. Uh, if I understood well, Bill, this was what you were promoting as well. Um, I think that's, that's one of the main, main um, crucial points to make clear in any dialogue. I hope I got you right there. <laughs> Well, we are right at the top of the hour. Bill, do you want to have any last comments? Yeah, I think I'll just um, really um, appreciate the um, all the very thoughtful, um, you know, what we're saying. I mean, I there is a uh, upstream technology, for lack of a better term, that has been mostly obscure, obscured to our awareness, and is. Um, but it's, it's, we're hardwired to participate with it. It's not really a big mystery. I mean, I think we need to work on our own um, personal access to it. Um, and, and it's well able to solve what looked like completely intractable difficulties. They're, lo they're nothing compared to the organizing force behind everything. They're absolutely nothing. And yet, from the human perspective, they look like impa impossible, intractable, forget it. Um, so I think we've got to, you know, to, to have the, um, to, to inquire into how we might let ourselves play in a, a deeper way is the sort of name of the game. And, um, you know, that requires continuously letting go of what we think we know. <laughs> however, however well developed, um, you know, it is. So I, I loved hearing a lot, a lot of the beautiful insights from people. Um, you know, it's something's happening. You could make that statement. It's like something's happening. You know, it's like <laughs> figure out how to crank it up. That would be good. So, anyway, thank you guys for organizing this. Appreciate it very much the chance to um, articulate it. I mean, I, I didn't know really what I was going to say, you know. Um, I'm really interested to see the transcript, see what I actually did say. <laughs> we'll, send, we'll send you the video. Okay, right, the video, we did, right. We did right. record everything. It'll be up on the website in no time. And we really appreciate everyone coming. This was an extraordinary two hours well spent. And with all the problems out there, I feel you've offered a lot of hopeful comments and ways of unfolding. Great can help. So okay. thank you. Thank we're you. On everyone. The, we're on the right track. Thank you all very much. <laughs> bye. Bye bye. Take care. Bye, -bye, everyone. bye all. Bye.
looks like we might have, have a lot of people who have kind of left the scene. Are you still there, uh, Bobby? I'm here. I'm just getting rid of a couple of people. I think people have just sort of walked away from their computers. So yeah, that makes sense. I will be two seconds. 